Let us pray. God of life-giving gifts, we come to you today seeking the new life you promise. New life given to us through the resurrection of Jesus the Christ, that we may find forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. May we cherish the hope you have given us today and for the future as we pray that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth might be pleasing and acceptable to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So on Easter Sunday, we have to ask ourselves, what is resurrection? Well, the dictionary defines it as the state of one risen from the dead. Now, as a paramedic, I've resuscitated patients who have died, but that's not the same thing. Resurrection is different because it is connected to a belief, a belief of an afterlife, like being resurrected at the Last Judgment, or the resurrection of Christ that we celebrate today, or even our own resurrection when we die. It is a hope, a hope that there is something after this life that we can look forward to. And it is a promise from God that we are to believe and to have faith in. And today, John tells us how Mary Magdalene, by herself, arrives at the tomb in the dark. But in Mark's Gospel, Mary's accompanied by the mother of James and Salome when the sun had risen. In today's account, she also sees two angels, while in Mark, she only sees a young man. So why would the gospel writers have such differing accounts of the same event? I mean, if you want other people to believe and have hope in this thing called the resurrection, why would you throw doubt by having these variations in the story? Now, the scholars, biblical scholars, believe that John is doing something very special here. John is using a literary device that echoes Jesus' words of come and see. For example, Mary, she came and saw that the stone was rolled away, which echoes Jesus' invitations of his very first two disciples to come and see. Another example is when Mary runs to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, for them to come and see. And at, at once at the tomb, the first disciple bends down and looks in, but he doesn't go into the tomb until Peter arrives and accepts Jesus' invitation to come and see for himself. Wonderful, wonderful literary device to remind us of Jesus' words. Now, another interesting point of John's version of the story is that the disciple that Jesus loved, he came and saw only the empty tomb. And he believed immediately. Immediately he believed. Now, this is a big, big contrast to the story of the doubting Thomas where Thomas would not believe unless he saw the holes in Jesus' hands and feet. And Peter, when Peter gets to the tomb, he sees, but he neither believes nor doubts. You see, John's version of the resurrection may differ from the synoptic, synop, synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but his literary prowess captures our attention at a much, much deeper level. John wants us to remember Jesus and his teachings so that we can recognize and believe the risen Christ without any doubt. And so John continues his use of literary tools to help us understand his teachings that he must die and then be raised. We can't have Easter Sunday without Good Friday. And, we've, 
And when Mary sees Jesus, she doesn't even recognize him. And rather believes him to be a gardener of all things. And this sometimes we can find very disturbing. Even though some try to explain it by saying, oh, well, she was just filled with grief. And her tears obscured her vision. But then, Jesus calls her by name, Mary. And she immediately recognizes Jesus. Now this dialogue should make us remember that Jesus is the good shepherd who calls his sheep by name. And again, John connects the resurrection with Jesus' teachings in such a manner that we can easily understand it, as well as one that connects us to Jesus in a personal manner, that Christ knows us by name. Unfortunately, understanding the resurrection was a bit of a problem for Peter. He neither believed nor doubted. He simply didn't understand that Jesus had to die in order to be resurrected. He didn't understand that this resurrection meant new life. New life after death and new life believing and following the teachers, teachings of our Lord and Savior. This new life is what resurrection is all about. It is a new life that is eternal by the indwelling Holy Spirit that indwells each and every one of us, and it's a new light that is guided by that same indwelling Spirit that Jesus used in His humanity. This is what Easter is all about. It is a time of year that we celebrate what Christ did for us. Through His resurrection, we now know that there is something beyond this life. But even more important is that resurrection brought about new life that is available to us in the here and now. New life in Christ means that we live on this side of Easter with hope, with faith, and with the power of love from within, from the Holy Spirit that indwells us. We don't live in sorrow and in doubt and in anger and in disappointment and in grief of Good Friday any longer. Or at least we're not supposed to. Too many of us live on the Good, side, good Friday side of Easter. Everything is negative. There's no hope. There's no relief. There's no happiness. There's no rejoicing. Everything is death and destruction. Many of us live in a perpetual Good Friday crucifixion where the Holy Spirit is quenched and pushed down inside of us never to see the light of day. This is where too many Christians live. We need to listen to Mary as she returns to the disciples and announces that she has seen the Lord. And because of her testimony and the teachings of Jesus Christ, we now have hope. Hope now and hope eternal. So let us rejoice with shouts of Hosanna, knowing that we have new life today and forever. May we use that new life to truly love our God and love our neighbor in all that we do and in all that we say to the glory